square fielder. He's gone to the dogs. Welcome, everyone, once again to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Steve Fielder here coming at you from the road, that long and winding road from Florida all the way up to New Jersey. Can you imagine a redneck hillbilly like me in New Jersey, about 60 miles from New York City? Corey Groover, my compatriot in crime is not here in jersey but he's one state over how you doing tonight Corey? i'm doing pretty good steve i uh i think you're probably still about as far away from me as you would be in florida <laughs> <laughs> yeah pennsylvania is a wide state isn't it i oh, mean from Lord. east to west it's a long long ways across there yeah, yeah, you're not kidding about that. Well, somebody, somebody said one time, the more that our country, our culture gets away from the family farm, the less common sense. Uh, we, you know, less common sense is prevalent. It, right here in this area of New Jersey, where I am, is in the western part. And there's actually some hills, some ridges. There's a wow. trout stream right near here that uh, I always try to fish when I'm up here, but so far I haven't been able to do it because it always rains. And, wow, and you know, trout fishing for or fly fishing especially is not good when the creeks are out of their banks and it's all muddy and all, you know. So without making this a... A fly fishing podcast, I won't talk about that, but there are uh, some ways you can fish the higher water and all, but it's just not fun. And for an old guy like me, I got to watch where I'm wading. <laughs> uh, I may be floating and bobbing <laughs> instead of uh, wading. But anyway, but yeah, yeah, we came up um, two days. This is the, the uh, third day I've been away from home. And, uh, of course, my uh, my uh, CEO of the Fielder household is with me. Elle is with me. We're here house-sitting. And this is a subject maybe we can talk about a little bit. We're house-sitting Susan's dog, Rocket. Rocket. Rocket Man. Oh, and right. Rocket is a rescue out of the state of South Carolina that is described uh, by the rescue agency to be hound and pit bull. Uh, He does have the body of a hound. He's predominantly white. He's got kind of a tannish, almost that yellowish uh, headset. You know, in the Walker breed, and of course, I think he would probably tend to be maybe uh, maybe a foxhound pit cross, but there's the red-headed dogs is what I prefer in a Walker dog. Then there's a kind of the, the brownish head, and there's the light tan the it comes to mind dogs like Lonnie Mears dogs out there in Missouri and all. And then you get this one that's kind of a cream, but it's almost borderline going into a brownish color. And I've seen this some on some of the wipeout dogs that have the black pigment on their faces and around their lips and so forth. And I don't know where that comes from, but the point here is old Rocket is one of the most athletic dogs that I have ever seen. I mean, he's like got, he has springs on all four legs. And I mean, he can move around the room like a mosquito. Uh, <laughs> and, and part of my uh, commitment to come up uh, and for us to come up and house sit and dog sit while Susan takes a much needed vacation with uh, some of her friends down to Mexico. I think she flew into Cancun Airport today. Maybe I'm not sure. But anyway, 
um, is to kind of, you know, take a little of that energy down. Uh, so, well, that's what I was going to ask you, Steve. What what does a uh, New Jerseyan do with a dog like that to, uh, <laughs> to keep it what, in good shape? Uh, okay, you have a daughter, right? Well, yeah. And you're going to have another one here pretty soon, and that's going to be a girl too, right? Yes, sir. Awesome. Nothing like them. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm adding do you imagine? Kennel, so. uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said I'm adding an addition onto the dog kennel right now. <laughs> yeah, for all the puppies you got. <laughs> no, but can you imagine those two daughters doing everything that you want them to do or completely follow your logic about everything? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Not at this I don't know. You know, it's that old. When I was in sales, it was like we had what we called the puppy dog clothes. The guys selling color TVs on the floor, you know. So, well, back in the day, now I'm dating myself. Guy can't make a decision whether to buy it or not. The salesman said, "Well, just take it home with you." And you know, watch it tonight, and if you if you don't like it, and you don't think it's a good buy, then call us, and we'll come back and pick it up. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah, but of course, when all the kids saw the TV that night, no, do you think that guy's going to get to send that back? <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with the new car. Just drive it home and, and and keep it overnight, and if you don't like it, bring it back tomorrow. Well, he's parked it in the driveway. And all the neighbors see that he's got a new car there. You think he's going to take that back? Heck no, man. (laughs) Well, anyway, these rescues, you know, this was a cute puppy, and he was cute, and he's still a good-looking dog, and he's very smart. But he has way too much energy. But now here's my point. Maybe some of our listeners can, can tune in on this a little bit. As my pastor at church says, now you got to lean in on what I'm about to say here. Okay, I'm leaning. All right. Um, In the experience of hog hunters, predominantly in the South, where most people hunt hogs with dogs, are there any dogs out there that are successfully crossed between pit bulls and hounds. I had a friend uh, in Florida back in my college days that used to, he was a plot guy. He said he would occasionally raise a litter of halves. That's what he called them, half pit, half plot. But he said they usually didn't last through the season. It wasn't because he was culling them. It was because the game was culling them. Uh, wow. You know, hog is probably about the roughest game that you can hunt with a dog. Uh, my father would not run his bear dogs on hogs. Some plot guys do. But it's yeah, a that, different deal. But that, I just that's wonder. Interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. That's so, really interesting. Yeah, I just wonder if there's anyone out there under this wide umbrella of Gone to the Dogs podcast that has successfully crossed hound with pit and used them for, well, use them for anything. I was talking to somebody, just this, I believe it was Teddy Morgan from West Virginia that has a pit bull female that's a tremendous squirrel dog. No kidding. And has been all her life. And a real tree dog, he says. And she's full uh, full pit bull terrier. Well, you know, I think that's interesting because a lot of the literature that you can get your hands on, um, I'm I'm talking from back in the 1920s to 1930s, you know, a lot of times when they address breeding practices or different crosses that are successful, um, you'll find you'll find the term bull blood in there. And bull blood is referring to those crosses that are made um, 
you know, between what we would probably consider uh, a pit bull and a coon hound. And I don't think they're talked about extremely favorably, but they did exist. And, they, and those crosses were made pretty frequently mm-hmm. by the sound of it. Right. Well, we know the history of these dogs and, you know, the, the breed uh, was bulldog and the UKC, one of their earliest breeds that they recognized was the American pit bull terrier. The American Kennel Club chose to call them American Staffordshire Terriers, and they're the same breed. They're the same dogs. They've been bred different lines down through the years and so forth. But And, you know, there was a time in this country where dog fighting was legal. Uh, in fact, if you go back in the archives that we've talked about in the United Kennel Club back in the very earliest days, there were results and ads and so forth on pit bull dogs and their success in the ring and so forth. Well, you know, times have changed. And and one of the arguments that we successfully used it in these ordinances around the country where these well-meaning but undereducated people want to ban that breed, uh, we would say, you know, of course, if the dogs were bred for that originally, they aren't anymore. And can you imagine a dog that was vicious toward men and women uh, being used in an arena, in a public uh, exhibition bout or whatever you want to call it? I mean, no, they were, they were always, you know, trainable, uh, biddable, uh, you know, great dogs and family dogs. And I've, I've mentioned before when we, you know, when I did my exploratory journeys down in the basement at UKC through the old records and found the actual registration document of Petey, which was the dog on the Little Rascals popular yeah. TV show, you know, or movies. Uh, it was actually, they were actually movies. But anyway, so we got really deep in those pit bull weeds here, Corey. But I would be interested to know if anybody's using hound and pit crosses, what are you using them for? Uh, do they tree? Uh, I know as far as being athletic, th- this dog right here is phenomenal. And he's a real sweetheart. I mean, he's a lover. Uh, he he'll pile right up on the couch with you and wants his head in your lap and and very sweet. But if there's a game to play or something, <laughs> and we have to be careful because we bring our dachshund along, and we have to kind of when they first get together, they want a rough house, and that doesn't bode well for little uh, Louie because of that. You know they're prone to back injuries. So, you know, a couple good stomps by, by Rocket and Louie would probably be out of commission. But anyway, he is, I can't stress enough how gentle and, and I mean, loving he is. He's just rambunctious. So we're working on that already. He's sitting back about 10 feet from the door because he, he liked to kind of uh, escape when the door was open. You know, he would dart by our daughter and, and be out exploring the neighborhood, you know, which, but anyway, uh, let us know folks Post it on coon hunting, uh, conversations if you like. And, uh, and all, and we're going to talk about coon hunting conversations in a minute, Corey, but, uh, I thought we might jump into this thing about the big event that's coming up just a week from, uh, tomorrow night as we, are recording this, I think, what are we on, uh, April 3rd? Yeah, April 3rd. Okay, so on April the 11th, which will be a, a week from tomorrow night, will be the first night of competition for the Tournament of Champions. 
Yeah, uh, isn't that exciting? Man, that is. You know, AK, AKC, man, i got too many KCs on my resume. <laughs> UKC really hit a grand slam with that event, I think. Didn't yeah, have it absolutely. back in my day. I didn't think of it. Um, uh, you know, we did things a little different. I will say that we began the idea of awarding championships on cast wins when I went to AKC. And UKC did pick that concept up in this TOC and uh, where a dog has to get five wins throughout the calendar year, I believe, right? Yep. So, and this year I think we, uh, if you listen to – Last week's podcast with Mark Miller, he talked about the fact that he had two dogs with four wins and one with a single win, so he didn't actually get anything qualified for this year. Uh, but uh, you get the five wins, not only does that qualify you for Tournament of Champions, it also makes your dog a night champion. Correct. So that's kind of a double-edged award there. And... Uh, as we're talking, uh, the zone, do they call them zones or regionals? In the regions. Yeah, regions. 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 Okay. We're held just this past weekend. I don't have the list of the locations. I know some of them. Uh, I have that. You but got that? I sure do. Well, lay it um, on me, brother. Region one was uh, Kirksville, Missouri. Yeah. Region two was LaGrange, Indiana. Some fantastic. Okay, let me do this Grange. little game. We're going to play a little game. You said Kirksville, Missouri. Kirksville, Missouri. Okay. There was a guy, a black and tan guy from Kirksville, Missouri. Do you know who he was? I bet some of my listeners do. Oh, I know black, black and tan history so well. Um,. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Heinz Wagner. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not sure about that, to be honest with you. A great guy, hardworking guy. Garnett Gordon. Oh, Was I never would have gotten Kirksville, Missouri. Okay. Now you mentioned LaGrange, Indiana. Who does that remind you of? Uh, I think you just like making me feel bad because I don't know. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to show you show you up here, buddy. No, you, that young mind of yours, I'll trade you any day. Yeah. I'll trade you any day. I always think when I think of uh, LaGrange, Indiana, I think of the guy in the cowboy hat, the blue dog man. Oh, Dave Dean. No, but that's close. No. Dave okay. Dean didn't wear a cowboy hat. I guess if a cowboy's wearing it, it's a cowboy hat. But yeah, Dave wore what I would call kind of a mountain hat. It looked like, okay. you know, Fair like enough. some of my old relatives, the Hatfields, might have wore. No, the guy that, that LaGrange, Indiana, reminds me of is Steve Burkholder. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Man, I was, I was think, trying to think of a historical reference. <laughs> well, Steve's getting pretty old, you know. Well, that's true. <laughs> I haven't seen that rascal since he moved to Florida. He's down spending most of his time on the golf course, I think. Oh, I but bet you. I, yeah, I always, uh, always enjoyed Steve. And of course, he's been doing the color work, the play-by-play -play and on whatever on the Tournament of Champions the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, I, I was privileged to be able to do that the first year. And uh, that was something we can talk about in a little bit too. Okay. What other locations we got? Okay. Region three, we have Mount Gilead, Ohio. Oh, wow. I can think of a lot of things there, but get, does, does anything come to mind when you say Mount Gilead, Ohio? Okay, so I might I might butcher this, but if I'm not mistaken, the only plot hound that ever won the UKC World Hunt won it out of Mount Gilead, Ohio. That's correct. Oh, all right. <laughs> For extra points, extra credit, do you remember what year it was? Ooh. I'm going to guess, but I'm, I'm not going to guarantee it's right. I'm going to say 1988. 
Man, go to the head of the class. Oh. You nailed that one, too. <laughs> All right. I guess it'd be pushing my luck if I ask you to name the owners of that dog. Oh, yeah, you'd be pushing it. I know the dog's name is Kansas uh, Sizzling Heat. That is know. exactly right, and you do get extra credit for that, too. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jim Cannon and Spud Reynolds were the guys that blew out of that zone hunt down in Paris, Texas, and came up to to uh, Ohio. I know Russ Downing was in that final cast with a blue dog. Yes, sir. Yeah. Was that would that have been uh, Tree and Blue Toad? It would. Yeah, Tree and Blue Toad. <laughs> And I can't remember the other two right off the top of my head, so I go back on the back row. Yeah. <laughs> I go back on the Baptist row back there. Back. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the only reason I know that is because I know Russ well myself. Um, I consider him a good friend, but uh, the very first coon dog I ever owned in my life was a, was a blue tick coon hound. And she was a, she was a great ancestor to tree and blue toads. So. I see. Was she all blue? No, she wasn't. She yeah. was, she was, uh, she was a grand pup to spare time spanky. Yeah. And she had, she had all her tan markings. So. Oh yeah. There was another great one. Well, when we do blue ticks, we'll dig into some of the, those great dogs like that. But oh, Russ yeah. Downing certainly was a force in competition hunting and, of course, Absolutely. you mentioned Dave Dean earlier, and there's so many, but we can get into that later. And uh, uh, okay, what what was the next location? We got Region Four out of Ten Mile, Tennessee. Ten Mile, Tennessee. One name and one name only pops into my mind from Ten Mile. Who do you think of? Hmm. Nobody in particular. <laughs> a former field rep for the United Kennel Club. Okay. A guy that builds and sells hunting lights. Okay. I'm going to be I don't know this. His name is Glenn Allen Roberts. Glenn Allen Roberts. You know, know Allen Roberts? No, I don't know that I met you him. You don't know Alan. Oh, he was one of the reps back in my day. But that's okay. who I think about when I think of 10 Mile, Tennessee. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, what next else off, we, got? we got? Next off, we got Region 5 out of Conway, Arkansas. Conway, Arkansas. I've got the name, and it's buzzing around up there. And it's not coming to me yet. When I went out to the uh, Blue Tick Breeders and Coon Hunters Association's fall roundups, they typically had them in uh, places like, uh, I don't know that they actually had it in Conway. They had it at Hope and Pine Bluff and, and places like that. But this guy's name is right there on the tip of my tongue, but it won't come to me. Well, uh, I wonder. But, I, I'm not familiar with Arkansas that much, but uh, would Conway be anywhere near um, some of the satellite clubs that they use for Winter Classic, or no? No, that would be a little out of the range of of the Winter Classic, I believe. Yeah. Okay. About the only club I think that they use in Arkansas is over at Mariana, and we've mentioned Philip Heron before. And yeah. And uh, Phillips Club over there, they they always take casts for Winter Classic. But uh, that's in north – oh, well, that would be in north uh, eastern, kind of eastern central Arkansas, uh, but not far – not all that far from Memphis. Tennessee. All right, what else we got? Is that it? We got region. The last region is region six out of Manning, South Carolina. Manning, South Carolina. I pass by that exit all the time, uh, going and coming from Florida. Um, I can't think of anybody particular except a about a million hunters that always hunt the Grand American each year. I think of. 
I think of Tim Kramer down at Ridgeland, Indiana. I think of Ed Ottman. Do you know what Ed Ottman's nickname is? Ooh, gosh. You're just making me look like a simple <laughs> thing to name. No, I wouldn't no. expect you. His nickname is Pig Eye. Pig Eye. Pig Eye. <laughs> Yep. If anybody you talk know. about Ed Ottman down in South Carolina, they'll say, "Who uh, Ottman's he in relation to Pig Eye?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, well, great I, guy and a real competition honor. Back let's in just his, put it this, let's just put it this way: I do not want to know how he got that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever meet Ed, uh, you'll enjoy the experience. I guarantee. you. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's uh, that's probably enough for my trivia foolishness. But uh, I like to play games with places I've been and things I've seen. And, sure. And, uh, well, it, it might be worth mentioning too. Um, the finals are going to be held here over uh, April thirteenth weekend. So that's going to be April eleventh through the thirteenth, and it's going to be held in Greencastle, Indiana. Yeah, Greencastle, what a great venue for a coon hunt. And, and of course, Autumn Oaks was there for for 20 years. Um, and uh, so many memories that guys my age would have of the of the hunts at, at Greencastle, you know, over those over those years. And uh, for UKC to pick Greencastle as their venue for, the the uh, tournament of champions to me was a great great choice, and uh, I guess Doug Cundiff was a field rep when you were with UKC, was he not? Yes, sir. Yeah, and see, Doug's dad Charlie was a field rep when I was there, and of course Doug was the kid coming up, you know. But that's a great group around there at uh, yeah. At Greencastle. I- I've actually been fortunate enough to, well, I, I mean, I've hunted out of LaGrange, in the, you know, where Region 2 is, but uh, I've hunted down in Greencastle. I specifically drove down there, and I hunted with Doug and Charlie and uh, Cody Carter a couple of different times. And I'll tell you what, for it's hilly, but there's some good coon hunting there. I can tell you that much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely so. If you get just a little west of Greencastle over there around Putmanville in there, you're going to get into the hills and those little little uh, valleys, you know, little steep little creek banks and stuff, you know. I remember one night judging the cast uh, out of um, where it was Sullivan, Indiana, with PKC during Super Stakes time and going up there, and it was a rainy night. It rained really hard. We met the cast uh, there at the truck stop just off of I-70 at Cloverdale. And, uh, man, those raindrops felt like um, lead weights when they <laughs> smacked you in the eyeball trying to shine a tree, you know. Well, I'll tell you what. Greencastle, Indiana, at least from my perspective, has really turned into a central hub for competitive coon hunting over the mm. past decade. I mean, you got guys like Tyler Pettit down there. You got uh, Jared and Keith Hutchinson. I mean, all all kinds of major competition hunters coming out of that particular town and that particular club. Yeah, and these are the same guys you're going to see that are you know, often judging at major UKC events and PKC events alike. And, you know, that's a pretty prominent PKC club too. Yeah, well that area has has raised up, as you say, a lot of good coon hunters over the years. Guys that hunted around that area. Tom Hacker in the English breed, uh um uh, Ron Taylor, the blue tick man who uh, yeah, very prominent in the old in the older days of Purina. Tim Whitaker, with his black and tans, also a a, a big Purina guy. Um, we mentioned Charlie uh, and and Doug Cundiff and uh, just so many around there. And you know the guy that was kind of my predecessor. Uh, 
a few years before that managed Automoke so many years, Manfred Craver, lived in Greencastle. And uh, if you go back in the old American Cooners, you'll see the original rules corner columns, which I look forward to reading every month in American Cooner. Uh, we, uh, you know, he, Manford uh, lived there in Greencastle. And I guess that was helped, you know, with the hunt being there at the Putman County uh, Fairgrounds. Um, and, uh, yeah, just a great, great area. Well, on this TOC, I was looking on this magic uh, device that I have here that has a screen and such. And uh, if I can find it again now, I think I just lost. No, it'll come back to me. Uh, I wanted to mention the uh, the breakdown here on uh, on the Tournament of Champions. Now, we mentioned those regions, and they advanced, I believe, 96 dogs out of the regions to the finals this, this coming weekend. Now, actually, uh, I say this coming weekend, as we are airing this podcast, we'll, we'll, the Tournament of Champions will be taking place the following weekend, I believe. Yes, sir. Okay, let's let's break it down here, Corey. Uh, as usual, the walkers are kind of dominating the field in these. Uh, how many walkers you got? You have it in front of you. I don't. Well, okay, I, I got it right here. I was going to give you a chance to really, da- really shine, <laughs> really there. dazzle the crowd. Huh? That's right. You know what they say, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you baffle them with BS. <laughs> 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 no, but there's out of 96 dogs now, guys, think about it. And who could argue with the success of this breed in competition coon hunting? 77 treeing walkers out of 96 that only leaves 19 more. Yeah. You're right. right. <laughs> How many, what do you think the ratio of males to females would be? I mean, ideally, I would probably say pretty darn close to 50 50. Uh huh. Well, but I was never good at math. So. Yeah. Well, you, I went about a mile to school. So I'm fairly good at math. Uh, of course, it was uphill both ways, snow covered, you know, back in West Virginia when I went to school. But well, anyway, yeah, no. Everybody's. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, actually, the males uh, almost a two to one ratio. And that breaks down to the overall entry. Uh, I'll just say this, put this right out there. They're out of the 96 uh, dogs, there's 60 males and 36 females. Oh so God. it's about 60% to 40%, uh, you know. But anyway, Train Walkers had 49 and 28. Which breed do you think might be second? Ooh, I'm going to say it's a, I'm going to say it's a toss up between English coon hounds and that's tough. It could go, it could go either way between black and teens and, and blue ticks, but I'm going to go black and teen. No, if you had said the next two breeds are English and blue tick, you would have been correct. No. The no. English dogs have eight entries and interestingly, the only breed where the, Females outnumber the males. Oh, that's interesting. There's five females and three males out of the eight dogs. You know, the English breed has always been prob- uh, pretty much second place in the registry behind the walkers. Very mm-hmm. popular breed. And, uh, you know, my favorites with the English, I, I hunted 
in North Carolina when I was with AKC. I hunted with a fellow that liked the English dogs, Monk Perry. And he had some nice dogs. And Monk was a guy to go out and buy a good dog. And uh, he had some real nice ones. But his dogs were predominantly red tick. And, of course, I lived in Michigan very close to a guy that won the world hunt with an English dog, Larry Wilcox. And uh, hunted with Larry many nights over the years. We didn't routinely hunt together, but we did uh, we did take several hunts over the years I was there. Anyway, the second breed is the English with eight. And uh, as I said there, the blue ticks come next with half that many. Only four blue dogs, three males, one female. And it, surprisingly enough, there's three crossbred dogs, two males oh. and a female. And then... Your black dogs that you guessed to be second, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's only two. There's a male and a female. And two where the red fern grows, red bones, and they're both males. They're chauvinists. They wouldn't let the little females play. <laughs> so, and I guess you know what that leaves but we're used to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I, do you remember the podcast? I don't think you were with me then, uh, or at least on that podcast, when I talked about the, we did a, a um, tribute to my friend Bill Wickham. And he went out to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, to the ACHA World Hunt with a dog he had called Bear. And <laughs> he said... When they made the opening announcement, they talked about 500 and some entries in the world hunt, and they listed them all, and of course the walkers were the most, and they came down the list, English, blue tick, black and tan, red bone, and to quote Bill, and, you know, this is exactly what the announcer said, and one damn plot. <laughs> That was it. So we're used to that position. <laughs> but doggone, fellas, we didn't even get one in this year. So, oh, boy. But, well, there's always uh, next year. You got to remember that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's hope springs eternal, doesn't it? Well, you know, this tournament champions deal is pretty cool. You go out there and you go to a region and you win. Hopefully, uh, they do a top. Well, each each uh, to qualify, there's a prorated number based on the overall total and the percentage of entries you got from that region determines how many you get to advance to the finals, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the way they do it there, the, it's two nights. It's kind of like a zone hunt for the world hunt. And they take double cast winners first and then single high scoring cast winners to build up to whatever that magic number is based on the overall entries from that zone or region, right? Yes, sir. All right, I'm doing good here. Yeah. Anyway, so there were 90, 96 dogs, so that made 24 cast, putting that public school math to work again here. So 24 casts go, went, will go to the woods on Thursday night. You know, I remember going out and being part of the media team on that first tournament of champions the year that uh, uh, our good friend Bill from over in Ohio with Bad Butch won it. And, uh, you know, uh, that was a real honor for me to be able to do that. And I appreciated that so much and got to sit behind the sport desk and comment on the cards and the rules and and all that. So it was a real honor, and I, I appreciate that uh, UKC allowing me to do that. Uh, but that was a lot of fun, you know, and they really do it up well. Have you been to a tournament champion score? Not yet. No, I haven't been to one myself, but... Yeah, well, they've got this uh, 
wedding venue, which is, I don't know where the popularity came to get married in a barn. Did you get married in a barn? <laughs> no. My mother, no, sure. all, my mother always used to say when we walked in the house without closing the door, she said, well, are you born in a barn? Close that door. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that's a big thing, you know. These and they develop these barns, or uh, timber framed buildings that are high ceilings and all rustic, beautiful. Well, I don't know how UKC found this place out there in the woods in Greencastle, but man, what a nice venue it is! I mean, it is first class. And they come in there, man, and they break out the groceries on Friday, on Thursday night. They feed everybody, and they do interviews with everybody, and they take everyone's picture, and they, you know, they just make a great big production out of it, and they film it all, and it's live streamed, and man, it's a big deal. It, yeah, it, you know, I I think that's the one cool thing that's come out of the tournament of champions is the media coverage. I mean, we've never had an event covered like the tournament of champions is covered. It's, yeah, it's, it's, by far uh, it has set the bar, and uh, you know, I applaud uh, Josh Michaelis what he's doing with this Kane Stream Media and that stuff, and Greg and uh, Scott and and uh, oh, they're their partner, I can't always remember the other fellow in pro sport. But anyway, uh, and they're doing a really good job. But this thing is just head and shoulders above anything when it comes to the production, the layout, the food, the the attention to detail. They have Yukonub as their big sponsor that uh, is there. And you got the huge blow-up dog out front when you come in <laughs> banners everywhere all tastefully done it, it's a it's first class in every way and if you're a coon hunter and you walk up that walk toward uh, <laughs> the building it's called three fat labs like yeah. the lab i don't know where that came from I'm not going there. I don't know. But anyway, it it makes you proud to be there. I promise you that. But uh, so anyway, they go out there and they put those 96 dogs in 24 casts and they hunt. What do they hunt? 90 minutes? Or do you know? I believe two hours. Two hours? Okay. Yeah. So then they got six cast winners that will come back on Friday night. So those uh, are actually have 24 cast winners that come back to hunt on Friday night in six casts, six four-dog casts. So, and that's a two-hour. Yeah, I have your note, uh, earlier notes, Corey. It's two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So now we've milked it down to six dogs, but they don't. You know they want a uh, they want a three dog final, so they run those six dogs in a head to head round, a ninety minute cast, uh, three two dog casts early on Saturday night, and then late the three that are left standing hunt for the tournament champion, and that's not too shabby the check that they get for first place. Yeah. 50 grand. My God. 50 grand. That's more than I paid for my first house. Yeah. (laughs) Or my first truck. Possibly close to my house and my truck. (laughs) Well, you know, a couple couple noteworthy things about the regions, too, is when when these dogs are competing for this kind of – you know, substantial prize, you know, that the the tournament of champions offers, there's actually a couple of rules that differ uh, from, from other typical UKC events. And one of those is, is what the requirements are to advance 
Um, in certain circumstances, the dog doesn't need to have a total score of plus points to advance. So I think the requirements are that the dog has to have made a legitimate tree at some point during the cast, whether that have been a tree with a raccoon in it or, or what we call a circle tree or a tree where you couldn't verify the raccoon was actually there, uh, but it might have been. So dogs can advance without plus points in this particular event. And also uh, the, the handlers of these dogs have the option whether they want to hunt one night or two, which I thought that that was total news to me. I didn't realize that was something that they were able to do. Now, this is at the region's level, right? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the other thing that I noted, the, the other thing that I learned that I didn't know about Tournament of Champions is there's only one scratchable offense when you get to the region, the Tournament of Champions, and that is being scratched for fighting. That will, will eliminate competition. But, uh, but that is the only requirement based on what I've read. So they want to let the dogs play. They want to let the dogs compete. Absolutely. And, you know, back in the day, and this might be picking at a scab, um, you know, that was kind of the basic difference in the philosophy of UKC and PKC, or at least we heard this from the hunters a lot, was in UKC, the rules were kind of designed to eliminate dogs. You know, scratch for this, scratch for that time limitations, throw the card out if it, the time wasn't down to the minute figured on the front of the scorecard and all these kind of things. And PKC's philosophy was more of let them compete, you know. Just uh, there was no uh, maximum or minimum number of minus points that you could receive to be scratched, and things like that, you know. So those were some kind of fundamental differences in the registries back in the day. But that's, uh, you know, the more of these rules, uh, more organizations, and all the more the rules are beginning to look alike now. Uh, yeah, and that's something that. the hunters have asked for for years. You know, they've wanted a uniform set of rules. Um, and I think the registry's a little bit on of uh, pride saying, well, no, we like our rules because they're our rules. And, yeah. You know, so. Uh, well, and I, have, and I actually got to see that play out this weekend. I, I took my little plot female that I'm hunting to her first competition hunt on Monday night. Oh, and yeah. Being that I was hunting on a Monday night, you should know what registry I was hunting in. I was hunting a PKC hunt, and uh and we actually saw that play out, you know, in, in that particular cast. I, I drew a three-dog cast, and uh, my dog went in and treed, and unfortunately she left the tree, and she ended up getting eating some minus on strike as well. But then she went in and treed a coon and, by herself, and uh, we had two other – the other two dogs had split treed at that point, and – uh, the dog that ended up winning that cast was one of the one of the other dogs that hadn't incurred any minus, but we didn't score a coon in his tree. He had a he had a total score of zero with some circle points. So, so did you have plus points? I did, but I had I had more minus points. Than oh, I had oh points. okay. <laughs> Your final score was in the yeah. minus. I got you. Correct. Well, there's little differences there, but uh, at any rate, so next weekend, then, folks, from when you're listening to this, and we do appreciate you so much, I just got uh, the ability back to view all the stats on these podcasts and see how well they're doing and all, and uh, uh, it, it, it's gratifying to know that as many of you uh, out there uh, as there are that that listen to us each week, and, and we really appreciate you for that. Uh, so, tournament champions, that's going to be big news. People be glued to their YouTube, uh, to their devices as this uh, uh, this whole uh, media extravaganza plays out out there in Putnam County. Uh, 
uh, Indiana, out there in the corn country. Be I know, big, I, know big time. I make a point of uh, staying up and watching the media coverage myself all night while it's going on. It, it's nice. Uh, it, it's really nice for a guy like me that hasn't had the ability to, to travel around and accrue cast wins to compete in this kind of event. It's, it's very gratifying to be able to sit back and, and feel like I'm part of the action. So yeah. I, I definitely appreciate that. Well, we've come so far in this sport from the days, really, uh, when the magazines were our only uh, connection to what was going on out there in the world of coon hunting, uh, unless we had close, you know, we had personal friends that we could communicate with. Long distance phone calls cost extra back in those days. And uh, so, but uh, speaking of media, uh, I saw a post this just today by Danny Doobie, the editor of Full Cry Magazine, saying that uh, the new issue has mailed. Uh, oh, has it? Really? Yeah. And this is a mustard colored cover. Uh, yeah, and it's got a picture. Uh, I believe, did, did you not see that on, on social media, the picture of the dogs uh, baying a lion up on that outcropping of rock? Well, now that, now that you mention it, I think, I think I did see something about that. I usually get my copy a couple days later than what everybody else does for some reason. But, but yeah, I think I did see yeah. that. Well, I haven't seen my copy yet either because I'm in Florida and and we get it late. And uh, <laughs> we used to, being in the publishing business at UKC, we used to get the people would complain and someone would say, I know my mail carrier's reading my magazine. <laughs> uh, so when he gets through with it, that's when I get it. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, full cry, man. It's uh, it's really a great read. Each uh, well, every other month, you get six issues, and uh, and wow, it's just a great, great read. And uh, I realize that most people get their uh, reading material online nowadays. We we know that's true, but there's a lot of people that still enjoy holding a nice publication in their hand isn't this one's all color it's on a, a nice great paper the pictures all all stand out it's just a great job and and kudos to danny and and to her husband jason there and the, they're just doing a good job and uh if you're not man i gotta wonder if you're not taking full cry out there uh and you you call yourself a coon hunter nowadays or a, a houndsman. I mean, <laughs> what, what what's going on? You know. I mean, well, it's one of those. I think it's one of those deals that you're you're perfectly content until you actually read it or subscribe to it, and then there's no way that you'd be able to be content with just with just your alternative options. You know? Right. Right, and there'll come a time, guys, if <laughs> for no other reason, just built for posterity. You know, there will come a time when those old cranky knees won't let you get out there and follow those hounds like you do now, and you'll <laughs> enjoy being able to reach over there and pick up one of those volumes and go back and read those stories. Got some good writers stepping forward, you know, and and. Uh, it's it's a wide array of of subject matter and and any houndsman would really enjoy it. Well, uh, we're not getting paid to advertise full cry, but I do feel like on this podcast we need to give our listeners as much good information as we can about our sport, the positive things about the sport, and that definitely is a positive. All right, Corey, we talked earlier. We've almost talked up an hour here, but we talked earlier about maybe going over to some of the things that have been posted lately to the Coon Hunting Conversations group page on Facebook. Do you uh, visit that fairly regularly? Oh, yeah. We got a, we got a few questions queued up from, from our listeners and people who participate with the Facebook page. So we appreciate you guys contributing to that Facebook page and 
and giving us stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to go first and pick one? Yeah, or yeah. Want- yeah. What, what we're going to do here, friends and neighbors, is um, just kind of pick out a, a few of the threads that have been on there recently uh, that's, you know, kind of sparked some uh, – some interesting questions, and some of them you'll find humorous, no doubt. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, jump on in there with both feet, Corey. Okay. Well, the first one the first one we're going to talk about a little bit uh, comes from Daniel Phillips. It was posted about five days ago. And uh, Daniel's question is, is being a loner a natural thing, or can it be taught? And if so, how? So in that particular question, he's talking about the dog's natural tendency to want to hunt by itself rather than hunting with other dogs. So how about how about you take take the helm first, Steve? And okay. Give us your thoughts on that. Well, we talk about this a lot about is it is it uh, genetic or is it man made and I have to be from the camp that most of it is man-made, especially for the guys that are really in the heat of the competition uh, world today. Somehow, sometime, it got to be popular to get a dog that would get away from the crowd, get away from everything else, and, uh, you know, get out there and tree a coon on his own I guess the original thinking was before another dog could, you know, even cover it uh, during the time limits. Those limits have have been shortened considerably. It used to be five minutes from the time a dog was treed. The other dogs were able to get in and get some of the tree points, a lesser amount, Uh, you know. But, and I don't, sometimes I tend to get, I think, too elementary in my descriptions and my answers. But the only reason I do that is to try to think about that guy that may be brand new to the sport and just doesn't really understand the way the rules work. But yeah, and you know, this is not anything real new. I remember when I was in Michigan uh, going hunting with various guys and they would try to set their dogs up to fail. Uh, you know, they would get a dog treed, and they would slip in uh, to the tree uh, and have their dog released by someone else back at the truck or whatever. And if that dog uh, came into that tree, they took charge of that tree and ran that dog off. Yeah. And let him know that, yeah. mm. and that's pro- predominantly the way that it was done originally. And then, of course, with the track and train features of the collars that we have nowadays, you know, you can watch that dog, and you can see what the, if that dog's advancing toward another dog that's either struck a track or is or is already treed, and you can dissuade that dog from going that direction uh, with that electronic device. And I think that's how most of these dogs are made to be just stone loners, you know, dead loners, they call them. Well, uh, and, I, and I think that there's a big difference a big difference when when we're when we're standing in the camp of natural tendencies and genetics and all that kind of stuff i think there's a big difference between a competitive dog that is able to get split treed and a dog that is naturally independent because i and i don't want to sound like i'm pumping my own tires here but you know, in my time in this sport, I can I can honestly say that I've had well over 60, 65 dogs here, different dogs at different times, at different age levels, different breeds, all kinds of stuff. And I can probably count on my one hand how many of those dogs I had that if you turn them loose to a dog that was treed, that would just 
go right around them and tree by themselves. Mm-hmm. So, you know, most of the time when we're in a, when we're in a competitive environment, um, dogs are just, these coon hounds are just naturally independent or not independent, but uh, competitive. Most of them are, especially when you get into the competition level and a lot of them are looking to get split, but I, I think there is a difference between natural independence and just being competitive for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly have had dogs that were naturally independent, mm-hmm. uh, that tend to be by themselves a lot, large percentage of the time. The dog we talked about uh, last week was that way. If he, if there was any way he could be split treed from the other dogs, that's where he would be. And I know that those dogs, you know, they were kennel mates and so forth, and and they weren't running him away. He was just just preferred to be, you know, on his own. I I think you bring up the word competition, and that does definitely exist in the soul of some hounds. You can mm-hmm. see it in such fundamental ways as when you first cut the dogs, that racehorsing toward the woods. You know, that one dog, he's going to bust himself to be the first one to the woods you right. know, to find something to tree. And my mind is going here in all directions, as it usually does. But you also see those dogs, we talk about that at some point in their careers, they get uh, hunt sour. And, yeah. and, and they don't want to compete anymore because they're sulking because they've gotten beat. They've gotten, you know, they're used to going out, being the boss dog, treeing the coons, being the first. And then here comes a little dog along that's treeing a coon here and there ahead of them. And they sulk and they pout. And, you know, some of them just quit uh, to the extreme, go back to the truck. But yeah. but at any rate, they just get out there and just kind of hang around somewhere, and don't you know? I didn't I didn't do it. I wasn't first, therefore I'm not going to participate. But okay, let's take this in this way. This always comes to mind to me when this conversation comes up. We look at a cattle dog like I, we had a blue healer here. And the natural instinct to herd. You know, Cody, he wanted his people all in the same room. If I was in one part of the house and Ella was in the other, he wanted to go get the one that was out there and bring it to the other. He wanted, you know, everything to be, have his ducks in a row, so to speak. Sure. Okay, was that just natural in some dogs? And somebody said, oh, I saw that in that dog, so that's what I want, so I'm going to breed for that. No, somewhere that was taught. My point is, without citing a lot of examples, labs with waterfowl, uh, you know, any tree dogs, whatever. At what point does the habit the 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 behavior become genetic makes that turn around the corner to daddy was this way dad you know we often say well if you've got a man-made independent dog you got to remember that he's not going to pass that down genetically his offspring are going to have to be man-made just like he was But there is a point where all that training seems to filter into the genetics. You ever thought Mm. about that? No, but that's an interesting point you make for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because if you think of all these dogs that are used for all these different things, how did they begin to pass those traits down? They sure. uh, either they were natural from the very start, and somebody was lucky enough to find one that would herd sheep, and this other guy had one on the next farm, 
and we bred the two. And so, the, yeah, I can see how that happens. But some of these traits, you know, and I, and I, I think I'm, a, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. And you can say, Fielder, you're old, you're softy, you're, you know, I'm appalled by guys that use <laughs> harsh corporal training methods to make independent dogs. Yeah. I, I if if he's not naturally that way, I really don't want him. Yeah. Now they're saying, well, Fielder, we haven't seen you in the in the payout line lately. <laughs> so you know, we're just gonna continue to do our th- thing, you know, and you, you Well, it's just it. like just like anything else, Steve. It, it's a good trait to have, but you can't breed it to the extreme. And I I oftentimes worry about that, you know, in regards to other things uh, that go that are going on in our culture as far as land access and all that kind of stuff. And I, I kind of wonder if and when we may head uh, the opposite direction as as breeders and as um, as you know participants of these competitive events. So well, no doubt we will, uh, Corey. I believe we will. Uh, it will be mandated to us. We will have no choice. Yeah, you're more, you know? more than. But uh, well, let's try to get another one. In here. All right, all I right. I think we've covered that one pretty pretty thoroughly. But uh, I know you had an interesting one, Stephen. I'm in, I'm interested to. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there was one that I thought was a little humorous. Well, there's a couple. Uh, this first one, though, if I can find him, uh, just a second. This comes from uh, Tom Johnson. Why aren't stud dogs moved around to different parts of the country for an opportunity to have more pups out of different gyps. Okay. All right. So who's going to take that one first? <laughs> well, you're certainly welcome to it if you want to. <laughs> if you want to take a bite. Well, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to play the stud dog game uh, a time or two with a couple of different males I've had. Um, you know, hypothetically speaking, I can say that that they are and maybe maybe not in the physical sense but you know uh the the beautiful art of artificial insemination and artificial breeding uh puts puts these stud dogs on another level that we could have only dreamed about 15 to 20 years ago and even and even further back than that but uh you know, there there are a lot of your major stud dogs are going to be collected. Their semen is going to be collected and uh, and either frozen or uh, collected in some way to use in the future or in different locations than what the dog is actually physically in. Um, so I guess the way that I would answer that is, is I think I think that we're doing a pretty good job of spreading the genetics around without actually moving the dog himself. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things that come to mind here, and there's several answers. Uh, let's see. Uh, this uh, Rocky Tanner answers, they ship semen all over the country, and it's getting easier to find vets that are successful at AI is my guess for a good main reason. And that's a good answer, Rocky. Uh, and, Corey, you've, you've already, uh, you know, uh, covered that there. Yeah. And... Uh, and that, and then, uh, and then here, uh, Cliff Owen makes a good point here too. That was probably one of the first things that I thought about is if I've got a dog that I'm proud of, I'm not gonna just send him over to somebody over in St. Louis just because I want to get him bred uh, <laughs> a lot. You know, Cliff says mostly because the owners are scared to let someone else have possession of the dog. A lot of things can happen, and AI is gaining in popularity. So that's a good answer, and uh, yeah, really. and, and I think that's probably one. Um, I will say Milton Baker brings up a good point. He says, "I wouldn't trust my dog with nobody." <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, Milton, depending on the dog we're talking about, I'd probably be in the same boat as yeah. you. So. <laughs> well, Michael Brown here. Uh, Mike, I don't want to call you out, but I'm going to have to delete your comment because of the language. But you say it costs more money than it's worth, and most folks in stud business don't feel like dealing with tire kickers. And, uh, you know, uh, that's a point to be made. If you're running a stud dog, I've talked to guys like Mac McAllister out in Springfield, Missouri, who had lipper, you know, when he died. Uh, actually, he was at, at uh, Joiners out, in, I believe, in Kentucky when he actually died and, and was, <laughs> was actually put in a, in a freezer. And and uh, Mac told him to go ahead and bury the dog, you know, and, and uh, that's probably a lipper story that, that some people hadn't heard before. But Mac, you know, told me, you know, I mean, the endless stream of phone calls. This was in the days before emails, text messages. The only way you had to contact somebody was through a written letter or a phone call, and. The phone calls would come at all hours of the night. Uh, you know, you got a coon hunter out there in a different time zone that's been out hunting that night, and he gets back uh, home and he uh, discovers that his dog is coming in heat, and it's three o'clock in the morning, and he said, "Oh man, she's coming in heat. I better call old Mac and book his female." <laughs> you know. Get him, get him, a, get her a slot, you know. So the phone rings at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, that's an extreme example, but believe me, that's happened many, many times. So it, it is a pain. And somebody says, well, I'll exchange that pain for the money. <laughs> and, and you got to be that kind of guy to say, yeah. you know, this money is really important to me. And uh, I'll put up with, you know, all of this aggravation. Probably one of the biggest things is a guy's call and say, I'll be there Saturday at 2 o'clock and don't show up. The guy's yeah. postponed uh, a family day, uh, you know, maybe a picnic or a ball game or something to be there to accommodate the guy. And the guy just doesn't show up. Coon hunters, I don't care. You know, I, I – at times, especially when I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, because I worked late a lot, I'd have a date to go coon hunting with the guys, and I'd have to call them and say, "Look, I'm going. I'm running late. I'm not going to be there at six thirty as we originally planned. You guys want to go ahead? Go ahead. I'll find you. Tell me where you're going. I'll catch up with you or whatever. Make that phone call. Don't have guys sitting out there." waiting on you, not knowing whether you're going to be there or not. And at the worst extreme, just fail to show up. You know, let your word be worth something, you know. So that those are just little coon hunting etiquette things that I'm passing along at no charge. And this would be the point where you'll probably want to hit the little sliding rule down there at the bottom and slide on toward the end. But anyway, uh, stud dog... Running a stud dog is not is not all it's cracked up to be, and uh, if the pups turn out great, well, yeah, that's a, that's good. But if they're not, guess who's going to get the blame? Even yeah. though they may not have had a fair chance, you know. So you're yeah. putting yourself out there to run a stud dog. That's for sure. Yeah, that's the truth. Is there any more comments in that thread that we should? Uh, I think, we covered, I think we covered it pretty well. <laughs> One guy jumps in and said, I'd like to find a good English male close to such and such a town in Virginia to breed one of my, well, you know, you get uh, 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 all kinds of comments. But, uh, and then um, Mark Miller, as we had on, the podcast last week, he says, why don't more females travel to the stud dogs? Well, that's <laughs> what every stud owner wants. But it doesn't always work out that way. 
Well, that's well, a good one. Know, yeah. Yeah. The, you know, a wise man told me one time, he was a red bone man, and his name was Kelly Hyde. And he said, if you own a good female, you own every stud dog in the country. And he was right about that. That's I'm exactly that. right. I've said that for many, many years. You know, you get a good female, the world is your oyster. You can, if you've got the green blacks, you can go breed to any stud dog in the country. And That's uh, that, uh, but on the other hand, you've, uh, you know, you got a nice stud dog there. It's hard to find the good females to breed to. And That's you can't the vet them all, you know. You want to. I've in years past, I've seen guys saying at stud to grand night champion females only, or things like that. You know, but uh, all right. Well, there you go. If you aspire to be a stud dog owner, maybe that helped you a little bit. Uh, you want to take the one about the the heads on the dogs, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> That one made me laugh a little bit. I'm not trying to be ignorant, but uh, uh, Jacob Perkins brings us the question. Question of the day. What trait is putting the smaller heads on dogs these days instead of the traditional big blocky head? Well, Who wants to start with that? Well, I don't know. Someone said, <laughs> well, there's all kinds of funny answers on this one. And one that popped right up at the top was fluoride in the water. <laughs> no, I don't know what fluoride has to do. Well, I guess, you know, we have fluoride in our toothpaste. I uh, wonder why we don't have a lot more tiny-headed people. I, I don't know. I don't much think it's fluoride. <laughs> but uh, someone says it's probably inbreeding. Now, that's, uh, that's taking a stab. And, uh, you know, that that's a whole can of worms right there, but we can open it. Um, you know, close family breeding or what we call inbreeding, breeding to close relatives, doesn't necessarily cause problems, but it does bring the problems within that line to the surface more quickly so that they can be eliminated. And that was the aim of the breeders in breeding family, you know, family breeding their dogs. Um, you have any experience with that, Corey? Well, a little bit here and there, but, um, you know, one thing that I might add to the discussion is um, there are certain trends that, that tend to pop up from time to time and generation to generation. And I'm not talking about the dogs per se. I'm talking about the people breeding the dogs per more or less. And, um, and, you know, trends, they get popular and certain breeders aim to please as far as these trends go. And, and big blocky heads were definitely a trend at one point in time or another. And, uh, and now, you know, there are a lot of trends out there that say, well, we don't need to breed the best looking dog. We just need to breed a performer, right? We need to breed the best hunting dog that we can. And, uh, and some people get to those trends at different times. And, and ultimately it does affect our, our gene pool if it's a, if it's a large enough trend. So that might be part of the equation there. I mean, just from my two cents, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's really hard to ascertain one particular aspect or one particular, particular genetic trait that's causing it. Well, yeah, that that's for sure. And, uh, you know, there's just things that seem to go together, like, uh, apple pie and ice cream, you know, um, uh, the smaller headed dog, the finer muzzle and all tend, and not always, there's exceptions to every rule, but they tend to produce a higher pitch uh, mouth, a squealy mouth. Some, you know, we think of foxhounds and you listen to a pack of foxhounds running, you're going to hear a lot of mouths that will somewhat resemble a pack of coyotes, you know. 
uh, and that sort of thing. The, the, and traditionally, the bigger chuckle-headed dogs had the bigger mouths, the blue ticks, the black and tans. You know, of course, I've seen some of these walker dogs down through the years, as we'd say, their head wouldn't fit in a five-gallon bucket, you know, <laughs> big-headed dogs. And uh, and that generally, you know, the bigger mouth, the deeper voice, the bigger head, the longer ears. The old hunters used to say, this dog's got a flat tree head. You can lay a rubber ball on the top of his head and it won't roll off. Yeah. <laughs> that and sounds like a valuable treat to have. There you go. And that went along with the tree knot. That was that, uh, uh, what is that called? Precipital bone or whatever, right at the top of the dog's uh, skull there. Students of canine anatomy will crucify me for mispronouncing that. But anyway, uh, and then having black uh, in their on their tongue, a black spot spot on their tongue was a trait of a tree dog and all these <laughs> kind of things uh you, you know a good one i heard one time was uh so i don't know what the technical term is for it but every most every dog has a bump right underneath uh their lower jaw okay and okay. i heard uh, i heard an old hunter tell me one time he said there's little chin hairs that grow out of that bump. And I, and like I said, I don't know the technical term for that bump, mm -hmm. but an old hunter told me one time, he said, count those chin hairs. If he's got three, <laughs> he'll treat. <laughs> <laughs> if you got three, you'll treat. Okay, guys, I want you when this podcast is over or when you, uh, you get, go back to the kennel, I want you to count those little, mo those little, Bump hairs, as Corey calls them. I know there's <laughs> got to be a name for those. But I just call them their whiskers. Uh, but anyway, if you got three, it will tree. Uh, I think it. I think it goes. If if he has three, he'll tree, and if he has four, you'll be sore. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, Gordy Dernick. Up there in Pennsylvania, one of your neighbors said, what trait, LOL, the small head trait? As if, <laughs> you know, there is a small head trait going around in our Kunam world. I don't really think so. If you pick up, uh, you know, your your phone and look at the results, uh, PKC started the, that uh, habit of lining the four dogs in the final four up facing the camera with the handlers kneeling beside them. When I came along, I had a pet peeve, and it was interesting to see that my uh, successor, Jerry Maul, uh, carried on that thing. I, I had a pet peeve when you're looking at those nice dogs, looking at them. I used to tell the guys, I said, just straighten their front ends up, okay? Get their legs square in the front. The rest of it is not even going to show in the picture. Just get those front ends straight and get them looking at the camera. And for God's sakes, take those leads off their collars. They're dangling there. We're not trying to do uh, a, a dog supply store to see how many different kinds of leads we got here. Just take the leads off and lay them behind the dog. Oh, man, what I took a ton of pictures over the years of winning dogs, especially when I was with PKC and AKC. And I would say, all right, boys, you know the drill. Take those leads off and hide them behind you. And, uh, no, I'd get the looks, man, the eye rolls, um, all, all that stuff. <laughs> but I want to look at that dog, you know. And as I look at those dogs, those photos nowadays, I, I don't see any uh preponderance of of sharp muzzles we used to say a dog could uh, uh eat peanuts out of a pop bottle you know his his muzzle was so slim do you see that much i i can't say that i do and, and um i do i have the good fortune to judge a lot of bench shows too and uh and you know honestly and, and the amount of shows that i've judged uh you know, from last year until now, I can't even say that I said that too often. So, right. Well, uh, it, it's been a fun topic. Uh, 
Jim Frederick out in Illinois says it's all the rat terrier crosses that we're making. (laughs) (laughs) Jason Jones says it's fox dogs, and I kind of already touched on that. And uh, and then uh, here's something about breeding, and we'll drop a few names. Uh, This Brian Atkins says the dog named Four Times Floyd is putting the size of mouth on his pups. Uh, and he shows a pup here, a big chuckle-headed pup, and he said, the pup is full of old Sackett Jr. and Nocturnal Naylor on his damn side. And uh, so anyway, yeah, you know, it's genetic, those big-headed dogs. Uh, the cruise dog that I talked about on podcasts for a long, he was a big-headed dog. In fact, I didn't think the rest of his body was going to catch up with his head when he was a pup. <laughs> but uh, – Anyway, well, that's uh, two or three people say genetics, you know, and uh, uh, Jerry Michaels will close with you. He said, I'd say it's inbreeding and lots of line breeding. Well, anyway, uh, oh, I, I can't pass this one, and this kind of goes along with it, but he says form follows function. This is Terry Parker. The more you breed for speed, the more you will see speed dog traits, which, again, we're talking back toward the fox dogs, you know, and the the running dogs. So maybe some so of that. So what they're saying is we're making them aerodynamic. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. And then Michael E. Shepard has the best one of all, and we'll finish on that one. Breeding dogs without a lot of brains. <laughs> That's why you got a small head. You just can't pack a lot of brains. <laughs> Which now that's going to um, provoke the ire of all of our listeners that uh, know that it's not the size. Of, I guess a small brained dog can have. Just as many smarts as a big-brained dog. I know I think about the little border collies and shelties and obedience trials. Man, those things are scary smart, and they don't have a lot of headroom in there for for the gray matter. So anyway, Corey, that's kind of going to shine the tree, as we say, for the uh, for the coon hunting conversations uh, discussion tonight and we've been at this almost one and a half hours so i think it's enough to torment these listeners don't you i i think so well i apologize for people today being on this trip i'm using a new setup here i'm using my uh my headphones with the microphone attached the way i do out at the events and all and i have I don't know how many times I've hit that microphone stem in this podcast tonight, so I know that's translating probably into your uh, your truck radio or wherever you're listening. But, man, we do appreciate you so much. I do want to tell you that I have got a new supply of the Zep uh, Lifetime Coon Squallers coming. Uh, they're on the way, and that's the reason why I suspended the weekly spins for the last uh, few weeks, but we're going to be starting those back up right away. As soon as I get back home from this trip, we'll be doing the weekly spins where we'll take a question of the week from uh, the current podcast and uh, post it on on Facebook. And if you answer it correctly, uh, your name will go on the wheel and you'll get to spin for the squalor, a $30 value, lifetime Zep Coon squalor, three reads with a lanyard, and you'll also get your own uh, uh, personalized copy of Gone to the Dogs of Coon Hunter's Journey. Uh, so anyway, that's going to uh, resume right away. Uh, anything to add, Corey Groover? No, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the results from Tournament of Champions. So if anybody wants to uh, – have a watching party with me, kind of like a Super Bowl style party, and then let's do it. I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I posted a, a thread or, or a post 
a while back, and I said, how cool would it be during that Joy Super Hunt to have a watch party at the tennis center in Flora and have all That's the cool. old gang there for a watch party watching the YouTube on a giant screen up front. Well, right away, all the replies were, oh, I'd love to go back to Florida for the hunt. I wish we'd take the world hunt back there, yada, yada. That wasn't my intent. My intent was to try to see if he could, we could spark the idea of a watch party, a coon hunter's watch party. You okay. know, uh, I think that would be a total hoot to have oh. a room full of coon hunters watching at the same time, you know. <laughs> oh well, I think you're on the phone, Steve. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe we can get that, that promoted somehow. Well, Corey, uh, it's good to talk to you again. It's it's great having you aboard here, and uh, you've made my do- uh, my job so much easier. By uh, I'm, I'm stretching these old. Uh, worn out brain cells to the max here uh, week after week. And you sure helped me lighten that load. And I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate these listeners uh, that are, are uh, coming uh, onto the podcast every week and listening and commenting. Send me a comment on Facebook or send to Corey Groover. G-R-U-V-E-R. Let us know how we're doing here. Anything special you'd like us to talk about, we'll, you know, we'll tackle it. We'll talk about anything, as you oh, well yeah. know. <laughs> Just about. Corey? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought I lost you. Well, yeah. i tell you what, guys. Watch that the uh, – UKC coverage of the Tournament of Champions, their biggest hunt of the year. See who's going to take home that big happy Gilmore check for fifty thousand dollars. That's uh, I don't think there's anybody that could uh, could uh, argue with that. Now I got to run out here right quick and buy a lottery ticket. I don't play the lottery, but it's like over a billion dollars now. I think in New Jersey. Oh. I mean, it's like crazy over here. So I'm like, well, nah, I'll wait till it gets into some serious numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I've always, that's always tickled me when people say, hey, it's only a million. <laughs> I'm not yeah, going to. Exactly. <laughs> okay, Corey, uh, the best to you. And uh, I hope everything goes well in the bunch maternity department you're going to be announcing the birth of a new daughter in may and we're all looking forward to that big time and uh, so listeners uh if you need anything in the way of hunting supplies for you or your dogs there's one place to go that i know you're going to be satisfied and that's double u hunting supply du supply.com Folks, if they ask where is the Pennsylvanian and the transplanted hillbilly, just tell them they're out there trying to follow around a couple of plot dogs, as hopeless as it seems. And they are treeing a coon now and then, uh, but mostly they've just gone to the dogs. (laughs) Good night, Corey. All right, good night, Steve. Take care, everybody. 